Here I am at my friend Ryan's house, and he has up here a menu. It says RMS Titanic, dated April 12, 1912. And this is what would have been on the menu. The Titanic was one of three giant ships made by the British Shipping Company named White Star Lines. The first of the three was the Olympic, which is here in this photograph. The second one was the Titanic, which you can see in this photograph, and you can also see they were identical. And the third one was going to be named the Gigantic, but after the Titanic tragedy, they decided to change the name to the Britannic. And here is a photo of the Britannic, which was used as a hospital ship at the beginning of World War I. And in November of 1916, the Britannic was sunk off the southern tip of Greece when it ran into a mine that was placed there by a German submarine. The Titanic was built at the Harland and Wolfe shipyard in Belfast, Ireland. Here's, a, here's Belfast, Ireland. And the Titanic was actually built right on this spot, right here. It was December 16th, 1908, when the first keel plate was laid for the Olympic. The Olympic was built right here where this grass is, in this slipway. And three and a half months later, on March 31st, 1909, the first keel plate was laid for the Titanic, which was right in here. And here's a photo of the Titanic in the slipway underneath the giant gantry. And to the port side of the Titanic, or the left side of the Titanic, you can see here where the Olympic is being built, right next to it. Over two years later, on May 31st, 1911, the Titanic was launched from its slipway, that you can see right here, that is a tourist attraction today. Once the main structure was completed, it was launched into the ocean, or into the harbor, and it was taken to a second location for fitting out. That second location was approximately right here in the water. There was a little dock coming out from about this location here and the Titanic attached to it. And in this fitting out process, the interior of the ship had to be completed. The forward mast with the crow's nest and all its rigging had to be completed. The four giant funnels had to be added and the rear mast or aft mast with all its rigging had to be added. This fitting out process took a total of 10 months to complete, and once the fitting out process was completed, the Titanic was dry docked right here in this dry dock that you can still see today, where it was fitted with the three giant propellers and given a final coat of paint right in here. The date was February 3rd, 1912, that it was sent to this dry dock for its propellers and a final paint job. And two months later, on April 2nd, 1912, the completed Titanic set sail from Belfast for its sea trials. So the Titanic made it out of Belfast's Harland and Wolf shipyard right here and eventually made its way down to Southampton. right here to berth 44. Now here is a photo of the Titanic moored at berth 44 on April 10th, 1912. And I want you to pay close attention back here on the photo. You see some people standing here and the dock goes out and then makes an angle off to the left right in here. That angle in the photo would be this angle right here that is still present to this day. Once all the Southampton passengers were boarded, the Titanic headed out. Came out through here and it made a left turn along through here. As it headed down the channel right here, there were two ships moored right here side by side. Next to the dock was the Oceanic and to the starboard side or the right side of the Oceanic was the New York. The wave coming off the Titanic lifted the New York up and when the New York fell into the trough behind the wave, both of its mooring lines snapped 
and the stern of the ship or the back of the ship began to swing out and narrowly missed the Titanic's port side or left side. And here is a photo of the incident. You can see the New York right here with its stern swinging out toward the Titanic. You see the Titanic here trying to head out to sea. And what ended up happening is the Titanic reversed its engines as the New York swung out in front of it, narrowly missing it and avoiding a collision. Tugboats were then able to push the New York around to this side of the harbor and hold it right about in here as the Titanic continued on its way. And that whole incident took over an hour to deal with. And it is said that some of the passengers on the Titanic were heard saying that this incident was an ominous start for a maiden voyage. So the Titanic made its way out of Southampton's Harbor and headed to Cherbourg, France. On their way to France, a coal fire was found in one of the bunkers of engine room number five, between engine room five and engine room four, on the starboard side, which is this side here, the right side, and it would have been this bunker right here. Eight to 10 men per shift were put on this fire, hosing it down to keep it from spreading while they emptied out the bunker. It couldn't come in and dock in any of the docks. It was too big, so it had to anchor off out here somewhere. And they had to ferry the people, or the passengers, had to be ferried in from this dock here, which means the passengers boarded the ferries, and the ferries took them out to where the Titanic was waiting for them. It was evening when the Titanic was finally on its way from Cherbourg, and it began heading to Queenstown, also known as Cork. This was an overnight trip. Ended up coming out to here. The Titanic ended up anchoring approximately right in here off of Roaches Point. That you can see, this is Roaches Point here. And it was anchored in this general area here. And once again, the passengers had to be ferried to the Titanic from right here in Cove. And the building they boarded the ferries from is still standing to this day. If we go down to Street View, you can see right here. Turn it around. And this is the original structure that the passengers boarded the Titanic from when they were leaving Ireland. You can see it says Titanic here. So they boarded the ferries and headed back out to Roaches Point where the Titanic was waiting for them. I'm going to turn this north. The date was April 11th, 1912 when the Titanic headed out across the Atlantic, hoping to get to New York. The route the Titanic took was pretty much a straight line across the Atlantic, and the captain was hearing about icebergs and ice in the water, so he changed his course to go about 10 miles, or about 16 kilometers, further south than normal. And it was right here in this exact spot, or at least this is the exact spot where the Titanic is resting at the bottom of the ocean, but it was right here in this spot where it struck the iceberg. This photo of an iceberg was taken from the Carpathia. They were very sure this was the iceberg that sunk the Titanic because there was red paint on this lower left portion right here. The bottom portion of the Titanic had red paint on it, and that red paint was evident right over here on this iceberg. They struck this iceberg at 11.40 p.m. on April 14th, and the first lifeboat was lowered about an hour later at 12.40 a.m. on April 15th. This first lifeboat was lowered with 28 passengers, but it had the capacity of carrying 65 passengers. By 2.20 a.m., the Titanic was gone, and a total of 20 lifeboats were in the water. 16 of them were wood boats, and 4 of them were collapsible side boats. The collapsibles had a wooden hull, 
and canvas sides that would be folded down or propped up to keep water from splashing in. One of the collapsibles was overturned and crowded with men clinging to the hull. When another man in the dark tried to board it, one of the men on the hull said, Hold on to what you have, old boy. One more aboard would sink us all. The man answered back, All right, boys, good luck and God bless you. Then he swam away a short distance and stopped moving. Later, several men on the hull claimed they recognized the voice to be that of Captain Smith, the Titanic's captain. By 3 a.m., all the sounds of struggling people in the water stopped. For 40 minutes, the people on the lifeboats had to endure the nightmarish sound of other passengers slowly freezing to death. It was a little after 3.30 a.m. when the Carpathia arrived on the scene in the dark. Around 4 a.m., the sunlight began to lighten up the horizon, and all the lifeboats started to make their way toward the Carpathia because they could see it. Over the next several hours, survivors were taken aboard the Carpathia. There were a total of 706 survivors on board the lifeboats. This particular photo is a photo of a collapsible coming up alongside the Carpathia. As you can see, it has canvas sides that can fold down for easier storage, and these sides can be propped up when they're in the water, which keeps splash or water from going in. And here's a photo of one of the lifeboats loaded with survivors getting ready to board the Carpathia. In this photo here, you can see the collapsible that was overturned that had about 25 men sitting on the back of it right here. This is also the collapsible that some believe Captain Smith swam up to and was told there wasn't any room for him, and then he swam away and died. As the Carpathia was picking up survivors, 25 men stood on the back of this trying not to fall over. Ironically, the chief baker, Charles Jockin, who was on the back of the Titanic as it sank, he said it was like going down an elevator and he just stepped off of it without even getting his head dunked, was swimming around the water for two hours. And when things got light enough, he could see this overturned collapsible and swam over to it, but there wasn't any room for him to get onto it, so he just hung onto the side until another lifeboat came close enough to him that he could get into that other lifeboat. He said he could never feel the cold or he never noticed the cold, but one of the things that he did before the Titanic sank is that he went and drank a considerable amount of alcohol, and they think that had a lot to do with him surviving over two hours in water that was below freezing. At 8.50 in the morning, the Carpathia headed out of the area with 706 survivors on board. By that evening, the Carpathia made it out of the ice-filled waters of the North Atlantic and was heading for the final destination in New York, right in here. Along the way, it was raining and it ran into fog. Around 8 p.m. Thursday evening, April 18th, the Carpathia pulled into the New York Harbor right through here and made its way up. The Carpathia was going to pull into right here, Pier 54, but before it pulled into Pier 54, it actually went up to Pier 59, which was about right here, to drop off all of the Titanic lifeboats. And here's a photo of the Titanic's lifeboats in the harbor at Pier 59 right here. I'm fairly certain that photo was taken about right in this general area here. Now, after the Carpathia dropped off the lifeboats, it made its way down to Pier 54, which is right here. It has been changed since 1912, but you can still see the original pylons in the water right here where the old pier once stood. The only thing original is the entryway. If we go down to Street View, you can see it right here. This was the Cunard Line's entry and exit way at Pier 54. If we get up closer to it, you can almost make the name out 
C-U-N-A Cunard, which was the company that owned the Carpathia. Exit Street View. The passengers exited here and many family members were waiting out here to see if their loved ones survived. From about April 17th to about the middle of May, ships from Halifax came out searching for bodies. They ended up finding a total of 324 bodies. Over a hundred of them were buried at sea, and the rest of them were taken to Nova Scotia and actually buried right here in this exact location. In fact, in this satellite photo, you can see a group of people here and a larger group of people here looking at the headstones where approximately 190 Titanic victims were buried. So there you have it. The RMS Titanic's location and route. Right here from Google Earth.